Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and it's time for part 15 on my series of the selected gross pathology of the gastrointestinal system. We're going to cover the parasites of the cecum and colon and a few spontaneous diseases as we finish up the diseases of the gastrointestinal tube. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank my colleagues and friends who have provided these images to me over the years, either directly or through online collections, and allow me to put these lectures together. Our first parasite is a classic. Nothing else really looks like this. This is a fairly benign parasite of the ileocecal valve in the horse. And it's known as a cestode, which is known as Anaplacephala perfoliata. There are a couple of related parasites which live in the small intestine, but they don't have this short, stubby appearance which is flattened at the back end. This parasite gets blamed for a lot of things. It does attach in the area of the cecum, the ileocecal valve, and very rarely the attachment sites may get infected or abscessed, but it gets blamed for a lot of changes in this area including ileocecal inversions, cecal inversions, and occasionally people look at it as a cause of distal ileal hypertrophy in the horse. This next parasite is a parasite also primarily seen in the ileocecal valve of neotropical primates or New World monkeys. And this is an acanthocephalin parasite called Prostanorchis elegans. We looked at one in the small intestine, Macrocantharynchus arudinaceus, in pigs, and they're quite similar. Um, there are two types of acanthocephalins in primates. Prostanorchis elegans generally lives in the cecum. Prostanorchis spirula lives in the terminal ileum. The intermediate host of these are beetles, especially cockroaches. In most cases, when they're found in free-ranging monkeys, um, the monkeys are thin, they eat a lot, they don't gain weight, possibly to um, irritation and hyperperistalsis, as well as a little bit of malabsorption, because these particular agents will dig into the mucosa, they'll bury their head, and every once in a while you see one that's been a little too enthusiastic and has burrowed through the wall of the gut, causing a transmural tiflitis and a suppurative peritonitis. The advent of ivermectin took out a lot of really great parasites. And most of the strongyles in horses, which we looked at in the lecture on the small intestine. One thing it doesn't do a very good job in are these small strongyles that live within the large intestine. These are much smaller than the uh, strongyles we find in the small intestine. They do not have the issues causing migration tracts, aberrant migration and damage to the uh, cranial mesenteric artery and other arteries within the abdomen. They're just small blood-sucking red parasites which embed themselves in very large numbers within the colon. Here we're looking at the L3 and L4 stage larva which go down into the mucosa and become hypobiotic, meaning they go into essentially a state of suspended animation. They live in these granulomas, and eventually they will all pop out and they'll yell surprise, and they, the animal will get a good case of diarrhea, a good case of sciathostomes, which is another name for small strongyles. Uh, oftentimes you will see old mineralized granulomas uh, in the mucosa of animals where they just stayed too long down in the mucosa and submucosa and uh, they became uh, overcome by the body's immune system and mineralized. So this is small strongyles or colonic sciathostomiasis. Nothing else really looks like this. A great old picture from the Wednesday slide conference. Esophagostomiasis. We've looked at this in the small intestine when we talked about esophagostoma in ruminants, in cattle, sheep, uh, and goats. And primates 
also get esophagostomiasis. The difference here is that in primates, both old world and new world primates, the, the helmets are seen within the muscularis and serosa where they also embed. They form reddish black nodules because there is some blood within these granulomas and they're found within the large intestine. Here you can see the classic tinea and haustra associated, the outpouchings associated with the colon of primates. This would be a subserosal granulomus colitis with hemorrhage. And esophagostomum apiostomum is a very common nematode parasite of old world monkeys. There are about 11 species and I try to remember one. And apiostomum is the one that sort of sticks in my head. Um, occasionally, you'll see these parasites in aberrant locations, including the lungs and the liver and the mesentery, and occasionally the diaphragm. They're usually mineralized hemorrhagic nodules. But sometimes, if you're lucky, you'll see a tract that goes from the granuloma to the overlying mucosa from penetration of these helmets. New World primates have an equivalent. It's not a esophagostomum. Name of that particular parasite is Melinius torulopsis. Pinworms or oxyurids. Uh, pinworms are seen in a wide range of species. They're generally of little uh, significance. They're yucky. Um, here we're looking at the rectum of a horse, and we can see the adult female pinworms, which are fairly large. Um, present on the mucosa. Oxyurus equi is the most common pinworm in domestic animal species. It lives in the uh, rectum, the distal colon. It causes rectal pruritus. Um, the females will come out at night and they will lay, lay their eggs on the anus of the horse, sort of a pasty, uh, mucousy mass. It causes tail head pruritus and the animals scratch their bottoms on fence posts and they'll take the hair off and they can occasionally cause some excoriations. Um, it doesn't really um, cause that much of a problem. They're certainly unsightly, they're certainly uncomfortable, but as far as pathology, not too much happens. A number of other species have oxyurid parasites, which don't cause much of a problem. Here we're looking at the cecum of a rabbit, and this particular oxyurid is called Pasilurus ambiguous. Um, it usually is of little significance. Significant infections may result in uh, weight loss and, and diarrhea, but you usually don't know anything about them until necropsy. The adult worms live in the cecum and the colon. The larvae are present on the mucosa of the small intestine and the cecum. The eggs are interesting, they're morulated, and they're flat on one side. They don't look like anything else. So. That would be an incidental finding. Oxyurids of mice and rats are also present in the large intestine. The two species that you probably should know are Cephacia obvolata and Aspicularis tetrapterus. These are occasionally pop up. They're tough to eradicate in laboratories or as the eggs are extremely resistant within the environment, the life cycle of both of these two parasites are direct, but they rarely cause any clinical signs. And it's always a surprise uh, to let a colony manager know, hey, you know you have pinworms, and they're like, I thought I got rid of them years ago. So they're sort of recurrent, like mites will pop up from time to time in colonies after you know all sorts of lengths have been gone to, to eradicate them. Another species that I've seen uh, pinworms in a lot are uh, turtles and tortoises, and, and they look like anything else, and I can't tell you the species name, but, uh, but reptiles do get a fair number of pinworms too. Whipworms. You know, a great case of whipworms in the dog. In light infections, they really don't cause a major problem. But in heavy infections, you can see uh, uh, diarrhea and hyper-irritability of the cecum 
and the colon. They primarily are seen in the cecum, but they can also inhabit the colon in heavy infections. And the irritation is caused by these parasites. They do embed within the mucosa. They do suck blood, but they do not cause the level of anemia that you see in hookworms. But the irritation of the colonic mucosa, which you can see here, may give rise to inisusceptions. Whipworms are seen in a number of species, including Trichurus ovis in the cecum and colon in goats, in this wonderful picture by Dr. Mahogany uh, Caesar. Whipworm infections in small ruminants aren't common, but you can see them in very young lambs or during drought conditions when, uh, when sheep are fed grain on the ground. The, e the eggs are very resistant environmentally, so uh, pasture can be infected for a long time. Not a lot of changes are seen. You may see diarrhea and some unthriftiness uh, at necropsy, generally for other reasons. You may see some edema of the cecal mucosa, but uh, usually not a lot of damage is done by this parasite. Some infections have been identified as causing immune suppression, so they may give rise to uh, allowing other infections in these animals to take root. Whipworms are also seen in pigs. This is Trichurus suis. This is a parasite that with development of anthelminics and a change from raising pigs outdoors um, to indoors has been largely eliminated, but you can still see it uh, in feral swine, you can still see it in, in parts of the country where pigs are raised in outdoor lots, uh, once contaminated uh, because these eggs, the typical uh, biopercolated eggs that we see in all the whipworms, once these lots are contaminated, the, the eggs are very hardy and may hang around for six or seven years. Infections usually don't cause a lot of problem. The damage caused by the uh, burrowing uh, immature whipworms within the colonic mucosa may allow for penetration by uh, Ballantidium coli, a, a normally non-pathogenic ciliate which happily lives in the uh, lumen of the gut of pigs but may turn up within the wall of the mucosa if that mucosa is breached by some type of bacterial infection like uh, brachyspira or by parasite penetration. And finally, the, uh, the whipworm of primates, including man, Trichurus trichiuria. Once again, it's present in the cecum and the proximal colon. It generally, in these species, incites minimal to no inflammatory responses, even though the heads are buried in the mucosa. It has a direct life cycle, and it may be fatal in apes. And apes are sort of interesting with these parasites. They're about the only species that will have severe disease associated with pinworms. They can get a necrotizing uh, and even perforating proctitis, and they also have a pretty severe response to whipworms. And, and whipworms can be transmitted from, uh, from non-human primates to uh, humans as well. Okay, finishing up, uh, basically scratching the surface, but also for this lecture, finishing up the parasites of the large intestine. We're looking at the cecum of a chicken. And here is a nematode within the lumen known as Heterachus gallinarum. Heterachus gallinarum is a roundworm that along with another roundworm, Mascaridia galli, is very important in poultry diseases because the, the the worm doesn't do very much. You can have some granulomas in the wall of the cecum and severe infections, but as this parasite is not that important, it is what it carries. And the protozoan Histomonas meleagridus, which causes a disease known as blackhead in turkeys, but can also cause diseases in chickens, is harbored in the eggs of the cecal worm. Histomonas is a, a protozoan parasite, much like an amoeba, and much like an amoeba has a lot of very potent toxins, uh, primarily ones which act as perforants and sort of non-specifically will punch holes 
in the uh, all the tissues around it, whether it's uh, cecal mucosa or it's inflammatory cells. They do a tremendous amount of damage. You get a necrotizing. Sometimes in chronic cases, you'll get a granulomatous tiflitis. And here's a classic picture of blackhead in Turkey. These are the two cecal. You can see the extensive sort of caseating necrosis. Uh, you, the animals will sometimes die after acute infections. If they last for a while, they will develop granulomatous inflammation. As these amoeba get into the wall of the GI tract, they will ultimately get into the portal system. They will jump into the liver, and they will cause a very similar nonspecific necrosis of hepatocytes in areas of concentration. It's also a little bit of inflammation. This animal obviously lasted for a while with this particular infection. The targetoid areas of necrosis in the liver of turkeys is very characteristic of this disease. The disease is also seen in, in peafowl and is being seen with greater frequency in broider breeder, breeder chickens. There's a second way that chickens can pass this disease, or turkeys can pass this disease, in the absence of, of heterachus, the cecal worm, or earthworms, and that's through uh, cloacal drinking, where contaminated litter is carried into the colon by rhythmic contractions of the cloaca, or vent. So as we, as we said before, the disease can be very acute, and animals in good condition um, die suddenly without a lot of premonitory signs, or it can be a more chronic condition where the animals will waste for a while before they, uh, they, are, they succumb to the condition. So, Heterachus gallinarum, the cecal worm, mild disease on its own, but a bad actor for the fact that the eggs will contain Histomonas meleagridis. Another classic protozoan disease of poultry, especially chickens, is necrotizing tiflitis due to Imeria tenella. And that's a classic. We've looked at Imeria cervulina. We've looked at Imeria nicatrix. We've looked at Imeria tenella. Uh, in that order, they're seen in the duodenum and the jejunum. And in the Sika, Imeria tenella causes the most severe of all. The lesions may be very hemorrhagic. They may be spotty. They may have diffuse hemorrhage here. Um, but whenever you see this degree of hemorrhage, I always want you to think instead of the necrosis, because we have large areas of necrosis here due to the presence of these parasites. And when they all hatch out at the same time, we just lose the entire cecal mucosa. Imeria tenella a classic lesion in poultry. Okay, so we've covered the helmets, we've covered a couple of prozones. Let's just look at a couple more uh, varying diseases, a varying etiology, which you may see in the colon. This is a classic one. We don't see much anymore. We talked about uh, how iver ivermectin is sort of wrecked pathology for all the really good uh, lesions that we used to get in horses. And this is a colon of a horse, and there are large areas of infarction. This is not a twisted gut. It only affects part of the colon, and the tissue is blanched with a rim of hemorrhage. This is an arterial infarction, and this, is, this lesion was classically called ischemic colitis or strongyle colitis in the horse, you can see that somebody's gone ahead and opened up one of the mesenteric arteries. And it is greatly thickened. It is fibrotic. If we got in close, we may see the presence of strongylus vulgaris. And strongylus vulgaris was often associated with ischemic colic. And the exact mechanism was never really identified. Some people say, well, it's due to ischemia, due to the remodeling of the vessels. And that makes some sense to me. Some people said, well, it was due to the embolization of these worms, but I never really saw embolized uh, parasites in these cases. Um, some people say, well, it is a uh, it is a substance that is liberated by uh, the interaction of the parasites, and it causes intense vasoconstriction of the arteries in the area. Okay, I'm not going to tell you which one it is. We don't see it much anymore, but it used to be a classic disease in horses when 
Strangia vulgaris ruled the earth. Great picture from Dr. John King, who identified so many diseases early on and does, does not get the credit for all of the things that he added to the veterinary literature. And this was one of his publications from the 1980s. Um, and this is the right dorsal colon. And the right dorsal colon is a site of predilection for toxicity of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, especially butazolidin, phenylbutazone, but any of them can do it if overprescribed. This was this particular condition. Look at the tremendous denudation of the mucosa here. Just sheets of the mucosa are gone. And this particular condition is seen often in young horses, often in ponies, and it is increased in dehydrated horses given nostril Of course, most of these nostril will uh, inhibit cyclooxygenase and suppress intestinal prostaglandin production. This is one of the sites of the GI tract, certainly not the only one where you see ulcers in animals given high doses of non -steroidals. You'll also see papillary necrosis in the kidney because those vessels, like vessels in certain areas of the GI tract, require a constant influx of prostaglandin E2 and I2 just to remain open, sort of wimpy vessels. And, and the right dorsal colon is a place where the lesions will, will almost consistently and characteristically be seen. Chronic colitis is seen in a number of species, especially non-human primates. This is a a cotton top tamarind and whenever you hear the, the someone talk about the cotton top tamarind I want you to think about the chronic colitis that they so often get. Nobody's really identified um, what causes this colitis. Uh, it's not seen in wild cotton top tamarinds. Actually studies have been done on the mucus that's secreted in the intestine of uh, wild and captive cotton top tamarinds and it's very very different. Um, but to get back to the disease, um, nobody's really identified. Coronavirus particles have been found in a high percentage of marmosets with this, but it doesn't seem to be causative. Helicobacter. So everybody's got a theory. No one's truly figured it out. It starts out as sort of a neutrophilic colitis. Um, so you have neutrophils and, and, and some small ulcers in, lam in lamina propria, and then over time, it becomes a little more chronic, and the infection or the inflammation changes to more of a uh, histiocytic and lymphoplasmacytic inflammation, and there is uh, uh, ulceration, hyperplasia of the epithelium. This, this hyperplastic epithelium will herniate into the uh, underlying submucosa, and then it progresses into uh, a epithelial dysplasia. And ultimately, a percentage of these animals will, uh, will progress to colonic adenocarcinoma. You can have metastasis of, of neoplastic mucosa. And you can also have translocations, not true metastasis, of dysplastic epithelium to local lymph nodes. So it's a, uh, it's a very interesting spectrum of disease from, from acute to chronic to uh, to neoplastic disease of the colon, which is seen in the cotton top tamarind. Another chronic colitis in New World Prime, or New, sorry, another co chronic colitis in non-human primates is chronic colitis of rhesus macaques, and this is usually seen in young male animals from two to four years of age. They have very little body fat. You see these flaccid sort of congested bowel loops with fluid content. Um, they exhibit marked weight loss and a wide range of different uh, uh, organisms have been identified over the years in this particular condition. A very recent paper in the journal Veterinary Pathology has identified uh, that these animals have a trend of Campylobacter and Trichomonad infections. Close examination of the mucosa um, identified an absence 
of the normal uh, bacterium which adheres to the colon, which is called Helicobacter macaque, and increased abundance of Pentatrichomonas hominis. So it looks like it's a multifactorial disease associated with some infections and loss of some beneficial bacteria. These animals uh, uh, manifest a decreased capacity for expression of certain cytokines, such as IL-4 and IL-13, which may also play a factor in this not uncommon condition in macaques. Here is the lumen of the gut. It's nothing specific. Uh, ulceration, edema, um, but not a particularly diagnostic uh, gross image. A particular subset of macaques with chronic colitis will also demonstrate these stretch ulcers. Um, and this particular syndrome is referred to as cicatrizing ulcer of colitis. They generally are circumferential and of course when you have fibrosis, one of the long-term sequela will be constriction or contraction of the fibrous connective tissue and obstruction of the bowel. Stay on non-human primates uh, for just a bit. Um, this is a problem that is seen in some of the older animals, especially the great apes that live in the zoo. And it's obviously a problem in older humans as well. And these are diverticula. This is a normal haustra of the colon, but these are large diverticula uh, in animals that may not be getting enough fiber in their diet. And these tend to get impacted with food and inflamed and may result in abscessation and perforation. Colonic impactions. This is another multifactorial disease in the horse. Most colonic impactions in the horse occur in the large colons, particularly at the pelvic flexure and the right dorsal colon. They usually occur at sites where the uh, lumen narrows its sphincters between the different segments of the intestine. And the causes are manifold. Okay, has to do with inappropriate digestion of food. So if you have uh, anything impacting on, uh, on, on chewing the food, like poor teeth, that can be a cause. Inappropriate food or animals that get bored and eat the bedding, which doesn't break down very well. Uh, systemic dehydration can be a real problem. Or in fit animals, they're doing really well when you put them on, uh, on box rest. You have a, a decrease in uh, intestinal motility. So all of these things, in addition to any type of ulceration, uh, can cause, uh, or change in feet, can cause colon impactions. Uh, generally, they're medically managed. They're about 10% of uh, overall colic cases. They tend to have pretty uh, nonspecific signs for quite a while. And because of the multifactorial nature and the fact that almost anything in the GI tract of a horse can cause an impaction either in the large colon or the small colon, um, a lot of times you don't find one particular cause. Let's finish up with a couple of uh, neoplasms which may be seen in the small intestine. This is a picture from a publication by Dr. Fabio Del Piero. And this is a large mass on the outside of the colon in a horse. And, and being on the outside is sort of key, not involving the mucosa. It's fairly key for a group of tumors that are seen uh, not uncommonly in humans, non-human primates, dogs, and horses uh, called the gastrointestinal stromal tumor. These neoplasms are derived from the interstitial cells of Cajal and they're usually subserosal or intramural. Um, there are a number of different, uh, uh, different immunohistochemical agents that will stain, but C-Kit is probably one that is most commonly used. Um, 
Your differential diagnosis for most of these is a smooth muscle tumor, but, but gastrointestinal stromal tumors can have a number or of morphologies, uh, including looking just like smooth muscle, looking like uh, nervous tissue and resembling uh, peripheral nerve sheath tumors. And they also have myxoid variants. So it's one of those things that anything in the wall of the GI tract of a dog or horse you should be cognizant of and make sure that you uh, run the appropriate immunohistochemical stains. Here is a colonic adenocarcinoma. We talked about small intestinal adenocarcinomas with the rhesus macaque, and colonic adenocarcinomas um, are one of the most common, if not the most common, neoplasm of older macaques. They tend to metastasize. Here's a great picture from Dr. Ann Lewis, who supplied the last picture as well from Oregon National Primate Center. And you can see the metastasis of this colonic adenocarcinoma to the diaphragm. Going back to our cotton top tamarind, a uh, picture by older picture from, from uh, New England Regional Primate Center uh, of a colonic adenocarcinoma that's just starting to sclerose in. And this one, those cotton top tamarinds probably progressed through acute and chronic colitis and eventually it became a neoplasm. These are usually seen in animal, older animals, about five to seven years of age. Some cotton top tamarind colonies have about 20% incidence. And the, the neoplasm usually starts deep in the glands and then burrows outward through the wall. Finish up with a couple more tumors. Uh, this is a colonic adenocarcinoma in a cat. They're occasionally seen. I think I see them more commonly in the intestine in cats. But as is the case with so many different types of carcinomas in the cat, they like to do a process known as carcinomatosis. They may metastasize, but they often will explant. And these epithelial malignancies will result in the uh, deposition of a fibrous matrix or desmoplastic response. And then over time, all of those fibroblasts, myofibroblasts will contract down. And so if the animal doesn't die of the neoplasm, it very well may succumb to secondary effects of gastrointestinal obstruction when everything is all glommed together. And here's a great lesion. Um, from an old Wednesday slide conference of a lesion that has been described variably as a neoplasm or hyperplasia. And this is seen in pheasants who are infected with another, uh, another roundworm, uh, Heterachus isolonchi, I-S-O-L-O-N-C-H-E. I hope I'm pronouncing that one correctly. This one doesn't cause, uh, this one doesn't cause blackhead. But the worm itself, like other heterachus, will, the larval worms will burrow into the wall of the, uh, of the cecum and cause a granulomous reaction. But this particular parasite, for some reason, causes these tremendous proliferation of fibrous connective tissue and smooth muscle. And so they've been called sarcomas. They've been called uh, pseudoneoplasms. They've been called lyomyomas. I think in the most recent uh, Wednesday slide conference in which we looked at this, we sort of hedged and called it an atypical mesenchymal proliferation. But um, these are ones that you're going to look at. And you're going to say, am I looking at a smooth muscle tumor? No, it's just a, a atypical reaction in uh, game birds to the presence of this particular pathogen. Well, we'll finish up with, uh, with, with prolapse rectums. Uh, in uh, mice, not an uncommon. When you see a prolapse rectum, you want to think of some particular, in, often an infectious agent in uh, laboratory rodents. And this has been associated with quite a few. Um, and most of them will cause marked hyperplasia of the, 
uh, ileal or farther down, colonic mucosa. Classic cause of rectal prolapse in mice is infection with Citrobacter rodentium, um, also known as transmissible colonic hyperplasia in mice. But there are a number of other agents, uh, Helicobacter species in immunodeficient mice, atypical non-lactose fermenting E. coli in immunodeficient mice, um, pinworms may do it, uh, and enterotropic mouse hepatitis virus in immunodeficient mice all will cause uh, rectal prolapse. A classic rectal prolapse in uh, a young ferret, and anything that causes straining, anything that causes loose stools or diarrhea can um, result in rectal prolapse, especially in sm young animals before the rectum is really anchored. Um, as strongly as it is, the anchoring of the rectum tends to increase as animals uh, get older. So um, often a rapid food change, an animal that comes from a pet store and is fed one thing and all of a sudden is switched to uh, something else due to the, the whim of the owner um, may result in a young animal having rectal prolapse. Coccidiosis, at least in the ferret, is something that because of the diarrhea causes may result in rectal prolapse. And then, then um, in baboons or non-human primates, once again, the result of chronic diarrhea or stress, this particular baboon had E. coli infection. And then one of the, the, the real problems that you see in any type of herd situation, whether it's chickens or, or maybe a group of non-human primates is when this particular segment of the intestine um, becomes uh, protrudes, you may have uh, a conspecific aggression or other animals will become interested and will, will uh, damage it even further. It swells, it can't go back in, and, and obviously this is a real problem. Okay. So we have covered the gastrointestinal two proper from, from the teeth to the anus and everything in between. Um, I have one more lecture in this series. Uh, I'm going to collate some of the diseases of the mesentery uh, because that is the structural support of the, uh, of the GI tract. And I think it fits very nicely. We'll follow this with uh, a separate series on diseases of the liver, also part of the GI tract, and diseases of the pancreas, which will be a small series of lectures. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you picked up some fun facts, and uh, I encourage you to continue to visit the Foundation's YouTube channel to see more of these lectures. Thank you for your time. Tomorrow's Friday, so look forward to another Gross Path Challenge.